So what we're going to do is we're here to expose it, let people tell their story, and let them, let everybody in the public see the horrors of the court system in Suffolk County, New York. Long Island Backstory with Chief Correspondent Gary Jacobs. Hi, I'm Gary Jacobs and welcome to another edition of Long Island Backstory where we're filming at the Cablevision Studios or formerly Cablevision, now LT Studios here in uh, Hop Hog, uh, Hop Hog, Long Island, New York. Um, my next guest many of you are, f are familiar with is uh, Dr. Carlos Rivera and um, we actually uh, decided to do this show uh, the last minute because uh, We've done a lot of shows about divorce and the uh, the ramifications of what it does, but today uh, there was just another person uh, in the news who committed suicide due to his stress caused by his divorce. He jumped off the George Washington Bridge, and Carlos and I, as advocates, have gotten to know, unfortunately, way too many people who have committed suicide um, due to their divorce, and he said, you know what, we, we really need to talk about this. Divorce is the number one cause for suicide in the world. No, yes, in the world, okay. How sad is it that someone would feel so helpless and depressed that they feel suicide is the only way out? How disgusting is it that this is oftentimes caused by the family court system? Is the court system guilty of murder? In my opinion, yes. We need to hold these judges, especially our chief judge, Randall Henricks, in Suffolk County, who allows this to go on every day. In my opinion, him, and these judges who allow these cases to go on and allow people to get abused, they are guilty of murder and they have blood on their hands. My guest is Dr. Carlos Rivera, a pediatrician with a minor in psychology and being himself a victim of the family court system and a vindictive ex-wife. He's more than qualified to discuss this topic with us here today. And I just want to start off, welcome to the, to the show, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you I just want to start off by reading something. I did a little bit more research before we came in today. A study by the National Institute for Healthcare Research in Rockville, Maryland, indicated that divorced people are three times as likely to commit suicide as people who are married. The Institute says that divorce in their ranks is the number one factor linked with suicide rates in major U.S. cities, ranking above all other physical, financial, and psychological factors. That's unbelievable. Another one, a study of 13 European countries by the Regional European Office of the World Health Organization found that divorce was the only fa factor linked with suicide in every single one of the 13 countries. The study showed that factors like poverty, unemployment, disability were associated uh, in, in some countries, but that the only factor in all 13 countries that, that caused the divorce that was the same was, uh, of course, suicide was divorce. The coroner of Butler County, Ohio, told United Press International in the late 1980s that he thought that the high rate of suicide in that area was traceable to men's in inability to cope with divorce. Dr. Richard Burkhardt said that he thought women were more likely to feel needed after divorce because they had children to care for. But men, he said, felt cut off from the role as head of the household and they felt they had no reason to live. Augustine Kapasowa of the University of California at Riverside uh, said on the early show with Joe Frankel, and this is a quote, divorced and separated persons were over twice as likely to commit suicide as married individuals. He states this, that in fact his study, divorced men ended up with twice as high risk of suicide as their married counterparts. He did not find such a high suicide rate among divorced women. He says, he gave three possible explanations because he was trying to find the reason, ba and based on his opinion. Number one, he cited financial obligations, adding that the courts in the United States are in a position now whereby money is given to the woman or the man is forced to pay alimony child, and child support. The man is also asked in some cases to vacate the home. I would say in most cases uh, here in Suffolk County. Um, Caposa also uh, noted fam fam family factors. If a man loses custody of the children and the woman keeps these children, there are situations whereby she may not allow the man to see the children, and that causes some depression, he says. Common sense right there. Happens all the time here. And one last quote. This is by Robin Williams, who everybody knows. And this is a quote. Divorce is expensive. I used to joke that they were going to call it all the money, but then they changed it to alimony. It's ripping your heart out through your wallet. 
I actually thought that was uh, an expensive, uh, expensive, quite an accurate quote. Yeah, rip, right, ripping so. your heart out yeah. through your wallet. So, let, so let, let me ask you this, Carlos. Is it normal for people to be depressed during a divorce and think about suicide? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the the statistics are overwhelming, and there's so much to cover in this uh, in this half hour that I, I think we're going to have to really kind of pick up the pace and go quickly. But of course, you know, it's a it's a huge stressful uh, life stressor, and um, there's there's something I think I want to I want to let people uh, aware that anybody with a predisposition to he mental health issues like um, depression, uh, so on and so forth. The a divorce is only going to magnify that situation. It's almost, it would be equivalent to having someone with an alcohol dependency and bringing them to a bar. So you would say it's normal for somebody to go through a depression and at least think about suicide when they're going through a bad, contentious divorce? I would, uh, normal's a tricky word to use in that, in that text, uh, context. I would believe it's uh, more accurate to say that it's, uh, it's, it's very often you can see that people have that. You know, it would be considered an abnormal thought, but I think that, um, Really what I, I think is we need to remove the stigma and, and acknowledge that a lot of people would consider it. Right. Not everyone, but a lot. I mean, I got to tell you, I mean, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people who are going through bad divorces. They don't come to me if, if there is such thing as a good divorce. But they come to me, I would say 98% of them either say they're depressed or I can see that they're depressed. But I say, how could you not be depressed? Yeah, it's... You're being dragged through this ridiculous system. You're being raped of all your money. Your lawyer's screwing you. The judge is screwing. Your ex is screwing you. The family's turning on you. In many cases, your kids are being, how could you not be depressed? It's it's, it's virtually impossible because uh, you mentioned, and I think first and foremost is uh, the children. You know, like being alienated from kids and, and how you find it's going to be. If that doesn't uh, cause depression, I don't know what That's something going to do it. And also how they can affect every aspect of your life. Uh, be it uh, friends, finances, everything involved. So your world comes crashing in. And I really think that uh, anybody undergoing a divorce, it seriously compromises their ability to perform uh, at the expected level at their job. Which, which is interesting that you mentioned that at their job. But I say you're asked to sign these divorce agreements all the time. If you're going through this major depression, you've been in court for three, four, five years, very common here in, in, uh, in Long Island, Nassau and Suffolk County, and now the judge calls you, oh, you got a stipulation. They call you in there for what they call an allocution. Oh, you know, were you under any stress? Did anybody pressure you? Fuck yeah. It's very I'm stressful. talking about losing my kids. None of those agreements should be valid, really, because you're not in the right freight. You said you can't work. If you can't work, how could you sign a contract that affects the rest of your life? It really is, and I, I think that it's... It's very silly in a one-sided argument that they, they, they act as though it doesn't cause you stress. And it's an enormous stressor to be in a court. Most people have never seen a court. Most people, right. the average person gets nervous when they get pulled over by a car, <laughs> uh, by a cop, a cop car, absolutely. let alone being in court. Right, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a very uh, scary situation. Now, just to pick it up, what is situational depression? Because I hear this a lot. People say you're depressed, and then they'll say, well, it, it's a situational depression. What is the difference between a situational depression and, or, or is it regular, but depression? Um, okay, so you, there, there's a lot to that, but uh, situational depression pretty much is accurately uh, described just in, in what it's called is the situation is causing this. Uh, so if you're in the high stress, uh, something that's an unusual environment, something that you're being called on a lot, that's very much out of your context and your, and, your, and your daily normal life, that would increase depression for you. Uh, we can go into baseline depression, uh, but, but in essence, in situational depression, you're going to be releasing more stress hormones. It's going to affect uh, what's called, um, oh my God, neurotransmitters inside your brain. It could really exacerbate anybody with an underlying depressive disorder. One of the things, every, everyone saw the, all these cases about Robin Williams and his depression, how sad it was that, that he ended up killing himself. Very few people spoke about the real reason that he ended up committing suicide. Now, I'm not saying that he didn't have depression uh, or other issues, but as as Carlos said earlier, the divorce exacerbates it. And if this doesn't exacerbate it, I don't know what will. According to the New York Post, and this is a quote, the comics shelled out 20 to $30 million to his ex-wives Valerie Velaraldi and Marcia Garcius. It's unclear how much cash Williams had left himself, but the last year he lamented that he had put his Napa Valley ranch for sale. And his quote was, I just can't afford it anymore. Uh, according to the Daily News, uh, that was the New York Post, according to the Daily News, Robin Williams' $30 million alimony to his ex-wives contributed to his death. You know, I was, I was reading something uh, earlier in the green room here, and uh, not this room, but the green room, <laughs> and um, w one of the things is he had to pay a uh, five-figure alimony payments or maintenance payments every month. Uh, you know, and, and if you, you know, what the problem is, and part of it that, that leads to that is that you're held to a certain earning potential. 
and uh, his career, he, was, he wasn't making quite the money he was at his peak, but yet he's required to continue to pay at a, at a, at a, a, at a, at a level that Imagine he can. having to pay $100,000. Absolutely. You know, what a stress. And, 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 and again, you know, I would say that's almost like you know, someone uh, suddenly has to pay their mortgage payment on half their salary you know, or, or, or keep up with their bills. It's a tremendous stress. So take that and, and multiply it. It's, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of stress that people and, are under. And, and, I mean, I know there's not this show, but I mean, who needs to get $20, $30 million? You know, no, I mean, it's, it's just an insane number. And in your case, insane number too. I often meet people uh, when they're going through a contentious divorce and they'll come to me with problems and they'll, they'll meet with our, our group of people and somebody will come to me and say, why are you helping that woman? She's crazy. Why are you helping that guy? He's crazy. And one of the things I say is, well, what came first? We didn't know them before the divorce. Did they become crazy because of this divorce? Because as you said, this causes, brings out problems. Now, you know, do we all have these in us or the possibility that we'll develop these psychological problems? You know, or is it just that, uh, you know, we had them all along and we just didn't know the person? I mean, did they develop? I don't. I mean, is it something you have all the time? It's waiting to to erupt in a bad situation. It's 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 both. You know, some people can just be put in a situation and develop a depression, and once things normalize, they can kind of return to their normal routine. Some people, if they have an underlying predisposition, you basically blow open the floodgates hmm. and take them to another level. And some of them may uh, may really really have a hard time returning to a normal life. I was I was once told by a psychologist that you know what it's okay to be depressed for a short period of time. This is quote normal. Our bodies are set up like this, you know, to I guess to protect ourselves. But they say, but you can't be. Your body is not designed to be under this horrible stress and depression for a prolonged period of time, which is what we see happening in Iraq and Afghanistan. These wars that there are people are under such hor horrific stress for such a long period of time, it permanently changes their brain, and then they come back with. PTSD, going through the divorce, I you know uh, that's going on for years and years. I see so many things: PTSD, high blood pressure, uh, anxiety disorders. Can you ever get out of these, Carlos? I mean, it um, seems like it's permanently. I mean, people lose their lives. You and I know people who we just had somebody recently. We don't know if they committed suicide. They had a heart attack. They gained hundreds of pounds, became morbidly uh, obese, obese because of the stress of, of, of all this. So, you know. Was that the cause? Was it depression? Did they commit suicide? I don't know, but the divorce killed them. Uh, absolutely, and that's one of many. And unfortunately, we're starting to hear more and more people uh, getting divorced. I, I've come, I come across one statistic once that said uh, uh, men in the high, high conflict divorce are up to 60 times more likely to commit suicide, uh, high conflict with alienation involved, to 60, 60 times more likely uh, to be at risk for suicide than the average person going through a divorce. It's an incredible number when you think about that. And um, we look at the statistics, I'm gonna, I'm, I know we have some points to go over, but in the United States alone, there are 10, 10 males uh, every week who commit suicide from uh, you know, the divorce and the parental alienation. And uh, yeah, in Australia, it's three per week. In the United States, it's 10 per week. And I believe it is higher, like you said. And recently, it came. if you look at those numbers, I, I sat down once and calculated those numbers. But anybody who's familiar with Long Island here, there's the Nikon at Jones Beach Theater. And that would, uh, those statistics based on how many people commit suicide re uh, related to parental alienation and divorce could fill N Nikon Theater every year. Oh so picture going, to, picture going there and be seated next to 15,000 people who have committed suicide solely from parental alienation exposure and divorce exposure. Oh, disgusting. How does somebody snap out? I mean, hopefully we're going to te teach something good from this show. How does somebody, how do you snap out of it? Because, like I said, these things go on for years. Somebody comes to you and they got three years ahead of them in a divorce, or they got a lifetime because they're in debt, such as, such as you. How do you snap out of it? How do you, I mean, I know people who don't understand depression would say, snap out of it, go on with your life. How do you go on with your life when you're not seeing your kids? I, I think that's How do you go on with your life when you have $500,000? How do you go on when you're being served with papers to put you in court? How do you get out of the how do you, how do you stop this way of thinking? Yeah. The, you know, there's, there's a, co a common rule of thumb that's kind of used in that most people, it takes about 10 years to return, about a decade to return to uh, some quasi-normal life after a divorce. Really? And there's a lot of damage that can be done in the, in the, uh, in the, um, in the interim. And you mentioned before post-traumatic stress disorder. There's a lot of times, you know, people, myself included, felt that I was more reserved towards people in the military who were uh, at, uh, their lives were at risk. But the truth is, you're exposed to stress on a daily basis. And they're actually looking to, uh, 
there's some now mention of uh, what, uh, changing the term uh, in relation to divorce, either uh, uh, was it law associated of law abuse or something, law yeah, abuse syndrome, legal, legal abuse syndrome, legal abuse syndrome, or ongoing st uh, traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel the same way when it comes to PTSD because that's a cause of uh, suicide also. I mean, you know, I was having problems sleeping and having nightmares about losing my children and not seeing them. And I, I went to a psychiatrist and he said, Gary, you have PTSD. I said, nah, I didn't go to war. This is, and he exactly. said, you, it, you, you do have it. It's not, you know, you have different, you, you, your, your nightmares are different, but it's, it's just as real. And to me, almost having somebody, somebody give it a name and say, this is normal. There's a reason for what you're doing. Now let's address the problem. For me, that helped it because I just why, why can't I sleep at night? Why can't I focus? Why am I having these nightmares about my children? Yeah, um, and and that helped me. For some people, it, it's medication. You know, they it, need to. It is, or it's a combination of two, and it's it's an involved process in that uh, you, your brain works on something called neurotransmitters, and this, the continued stress can throw off the balance. And after a while. I often tell people it's equivalent to sitting in a room full of smokers. At first you might not notice it, uh, but then somebody who comes into the room uh, may be like, my God, how are you sitting in here with all that smoke? It's like, you know, I've been under this stress so long, I didn't realize what was actually taking place as far as neurochemistry yeah. in my head. Yeah, no, that, that's definitely said. So, so, so let's go, so how, how can somebody, what, what do they do? They're, they're watching the show, they're going through a divorce, and they, they know they're depressed. They know that they can't sleep at night. They know they, they break down easily and cry. They know they fight with their, their, new, their new boyfriend, their new girlfriend. They snap, they can't focus. I mean, because when you lose your kids and you're losing everything, it's hard, how do you care about work? You, you know, you don't. You, you're like, hey, this, I'm losing my kids. I don't care about what's going on in the whole rest of the world. Your, your life is on the continued stress. And I think that one of the biggest things we have to do is take away the stigma of any mental health issues or depression issues that are a direct result of the divorce process. You, you made a comment in your opening statement where there's blood on the hands of those in the court. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 couldn't agree, I couldn't agree with you more. I really think that the courts are well aware of the stress that they induce, the uh, the depression that they induce, and then they fall through. I think they cause it. They, they, well, I, I agree with you uh, that they well, cause no, no, it. I'm sorry, we know they cause it, but they like it because what happens is, I'm telling you, you don't have to be a genius, mostly judges aren't. So you don't have to be a genius to know that if you keep somebody under this stress, they're gonna snap. Well, they're gonna do something wrong, and the person who's alienated falls into this all the time. They, they, they're they under stress all the time. They're going to court every month. The courts aren't doing a goddamn thing about it. Finally, the guy one day snaps and says, you know, to the kids, you know what, I'm sick of this shit. I want to see you. Alec Baldwin, for example. They, they call their ex-wife and they say, you bitch, I want to see my fucking kids. Let me see them. They take that into court and they go, see, he's crazy. He can't see his kids. It is, you know, and the big thing, too, is not only do we have to take away the bias associated with mental health issues, depression associated with, with it, also we have to remember that, that it affects both genders, which is a big, right. which is a big topic to talk about. It's not uh, singly men that are affected. There's women who have their children taken away or exposed to this. Uh, or high risk of suicide. But to get back to the point, I wanted to make one of the one or two points I really want to make tonight is that uh, the courts are well aware of the, the stress they're inducing and I feel that anybody involved in it is uh, liable. They're, they're, they're responsible, they're, they're a culprit uh, or an accomplice in this and that they know what's going on and I think that we need to take away the stigma and also hold those accountable instead of the courts being able to take victims of depression and making it worse for them. Victimize them even, even yeah, so well, In you, your you, case, you, they laughed at it. Yeah, that's, you know, that, that's a they certain thing about themselves. They, they did. Because it's not like a cancer tumor growing out of your head or a woman who's got breast cancer and has her breast removed. That You can't see this. Yeah. And somebody comes in and you don't talk because your lawyer's talking for you, so you're just standing there. They don't know inside your head this turmoil that's going on. It, and it's actually, it's physically debilitating. It is, it is an actual health, treatable health condition. Uh, and it's an actual medical disorder. It's not something that's made up in your head or something along those lines. I think it's a very important point to make. And one of the things that I often feel is that you know the, the induced depression that they put in people on their the despondency. I would say it's a violation of America the Civil Liberties Disabilities Act. Disabilities Act, in that you know if I was if I walked into court and say I was a w, double amputee or I was a victim of a stroke, it'd be very very obvious that I had a disability. Uh, I, ha I know a gentleman that was uh, being quite abused in court and finally developed a, a, a significant cardiac condition. Came in with the cardiac monitor and I had a, 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 fib, a defibrillator implanted, and finally when the court saw that, they said, okay, let's lay off of them. But it wasn't until it became that obvious that they actually addressed the health issue affected by it. No, it's, and you know what? Everybody knows that you cannot think clearly when you're suffering depression and PTSD. The case should, really, you shouldn't go forward. They should say, we're gonna, 
either resolve this amicably to take away the stress or we're not going to make a decision. Because how can you testify when you're, you're sleeping all day, you're up all night, and people do avoidance. And I don't know if this is a, you know, you would know better than me, but when people, are, from what I've seen just anecdotally, people who are depressed, they do this avoidance thing. So for example, the legal papers come in, you throw them in the garbage, you don't even open the envelope, you don't want to read the decision. You get an email from your lawyer, you, you don't want to read it. The lawyer says, we got to prepare for court. You don't want to prepare for court because you're subjecting yourself to it's, pain. It's a, it's a traumatic experience, and I think that people become numb or they, they actually uh, really are almost like paralyzed with fear. And what I feel is like uh, putting a lot of people through that would be almost like uh, describing a horrific accident involving uh, a death, something that, that completely scared them, or, or honestly, uh, in some cases, uh, you know, a victim of violence and having them describe how they were victimized. Right. In a, and we don't want to do that. Manner. We always talk about putting rape victims on the stand. You, we don't let them re-victimize the rape victim, which yeah. I, I understand. You should, it's you know, completely I, I, I understand that. And, and I, I honestly believe, and it may offend some people, that it is, the, the comparison is there. It's, it's comparable. Uh, well, yeah. um, and, and these are the things people need to know. And I do want to point out, because I know we have limited time on your show. you got the last couple and, of minutes, and Carlos. And that... Um, um, I, I want to point out that as a physician, it's, it's my fight, one, to protect children from alienation and the adverse effects. I would like for people to look into something called the ACEs study, adverse childhood experiences, which could affect uh, how children's brains are developed and how they develop uh, maladaptive social te uh, techniques, then risky behavior, then health effects, and then finally early death. So it's an interesting study. But also uh, as a physician, I, I'm, I'm very, very concerned with uh, the preservation of life, obviously, I've, I've dedicated my life to it. There's parents, loving parents, who are succumbing to depression and suicide uh, daily. And this is a crisis. We need to do something. The courts are aware of it. And it's my, my fight to, 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 to abolish uh, parental alienation. Carlos, what, to, we're running out of time. What's your message? Talk to the people my, watching it who's somebody's going through a bad divorce and thinking that it's just a hopeless situation. And it may be a hopeless situation financially and with their kids and with the court. Honestly, it may be. What do you tell that person? Uh, you know, keep your support network as strong as possible. Um, you know, seek help. Don't don't shy away from health. Uh, expect yourself to be depressed and under stress, and streak, uh, uh, seek uh, the help from uh, professionals and uh, and your fr family and friends, counselors, to get you through it. But the um, the the last thing that I, I wanted to mention is I want to take away the stigmata associated with mental health issues. I'm open about suffering from depression and bipolar depression as a, as a professional. You can suffer from these conditions and, and have a quite demanding career uh, and be a, a, any profession whatsoever. It doesn't really uh, discriminate between gender, professions, uh, socioeconomic status. So really, uh, we have to take away the, the stigmata. We have to fight together against this and put the pressure on the courts for their liability and the blood on their hands for inducing this problem. Great. Uh, Carlos, thank you for coming. Again, I just want to say to anybody watching this who may have Googled uh, depression with divorce and, and, and got to the end of this video, that there is life after divorce. You know, yes, you may not have the same financial status. Carlos can attest that. I can attest to that. You may have to learn to adjust to living without your children. I've had to live with that. Carlos has had to live with that. You have to just recalibrate your life is, is the way I try to get it. You know, Carlos has dedicated his life uh, his life to preventing parental alienation and helping others and that's giving him something to to live for he still has two children that talk to him that he loves dearly and that gives him uh, that gives him something to live for you have to recalibrate your life I've become an advocate um, you just have to recalibrate you know what you know, the money's not there like it used to be and I don't have the family vacations with my children God knows I miss it but I do find happiness in my life. You will find happiness in your life, and everybody can find happiness. Get a support group, as Carlos said. There's plenty of them on, on Facebook. So, uh, I'm Gary Jacobs, and, and thank you for sticking with us, uh, Long Island Backstory, and watching this difficult episode uh, on a very, very serious topic, uh, such as divorce. Get help if you're, if you're thinking about it. Get, get help.
Long Island backstory. Chief Correspondent Gary Jacobs is uncovering the truth on Long Island. The family court system. Red light cameras. Corruption in local politics. The heroin epidemic. Corrupt judges. At Long Island Backstory, we uncover the truth that the Cablevision news monopoly won't dare touch. We uncover the details you won't see on News 12 or in Newsday. We are local independent media at its best. Long Island Backstory, available on Public Access TV and on YouTube. Todd's a great guy. I mean, look at him. What a sweetheart. Attaboy. Wait, Todd, what are you doing? How totally selfish and untod like of you. Come on, Todd. Come on, man. Long Island Backstory. Long Island Backstory.